Rod Harrington, uh, a name synonymous with DAS around the world, both as a player and an administrator. Thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. Would like to start with a brief synopsis of, of um, your playing career. What got you into darts? And then when you got into it, what were the, what were the highs? What were the lows? What, you know, the characters that you came up against? Because there were many and varied. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I got into darts um, as a teenager. You didn't go out a lot. So um, I met a girl who ended up being my wife, who I'm still married to, 40 years. We just went down the local pub, so you know, to go out, you play for the local dart team. And back then, I, I, I got good, you know, you know, I played Super League. But then we got married, and I uh, went onto the building, started off as a footballer, Southland United. Didn't make the first team, but then played in the money leagues around Essex uh, for a good number of years, ruptured me Achilles tendon. Uh, that, that pushed me out of it. Anyway, we uh, I went on the building, which was big in my area, my family were builders. And um, so we, we just went on there. So I didn't play darts, I just packed it up. It wasn't anything. I was an outdoor person anyway, you know. Um, and then we took on a bar. And then to run up trade, we um, started up dart teams. And then one Friday night, um, a certain top Essex player's friend walked in and was giving it all a big I am and all that. And so he, um, he got told to go away in very the, politely in, in, in the old-fashioned way and he said oh my mate's the best player around here he's one of the best in the country and all that so i just and i don't know why i said i said bring him back in here in a month's time and i played for 500 quid so this was about 80 86 85 somewhere around there and so about three nights later um, these two guys walked in i didn't know who he was at the time and I thought they were coming for a bit of a ruck. I don't need all this. <laughs> um, and he said, you want to play me for 500 quid? I said, well, I ain't the way it was, you know. I said, but do you know what? Yeah, I ain't backing down now. So a month later, he, he walked in and I practiced and practiced. And he walked in and I beat him. And then we played the return over his club. He beat me. And then he said, um, you know, we ought to start practicing together because, you know, we might be able to make something of it. So we started practicing. Uh, we've become very good friends. Um, we travelled together, and it was Kevin Painter. Mm -hmm. So um, even to this day, you know, I see him. We always have a chat about the old times, what we did, when we was practicing, and whatever. So that's how I got into darts from there. And then <clears throat> there's always flukes in life, and you you know you have avenues, and you take the right one. But at the same time, I was doing the roof on a on a massive house. Uh, about five miles from me, and a, a bloke from London had moved there, and he owned a company called Durrow Darts, Paul Durant. Um, and he, I, I did his roof, and I'd won a tournament on the Saturday, and I was finishing his roof up on the Sunday, and he'd come out, he said, you know, it was in the news of the world at the time, he said, is this you? I went, yeah, I won three grand yesterday. And he said, um, I'd like to help you out, um, and I have first offer to sign you up. Okay. You're going to pay for me to travel. Um, and so then a then couple of flukes were the, the things that, that put me on the, the line to then being a, a professional dart player. Um, and, and I travelled all over the world from there. And I started winning pretty early on, on in my career. So, um, you know, it, it's always hard to find that first win. But I had the first win very early, very early. And, uh, you know, John Paul Masters, Cockney Classic. And then as I started winning on the tour, and then I won the World Masters and, you know, with the British Gold Cup and then, you know, the Danish Open three times, Swedish three, you know, I, I won. I think a, a total of about 55 tournaments, ranking tournaments worldwide, held the number one spot for four different occasions. One of them, I held it for 23 months. And, you know, that's when Phil Taylor was in his prime, Dennis Preach, Lee Alan Warren, Peter Everson, you know, the, the Eric Bristows, although they were on on the wane a little bit yeah. of Jockey Wilson and that and new breed were coming through. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was a tidy player. You know, the highs, um, I think the highs, although I won the match play twice and, you know, the World Masters set in the Gold Cup, I think the, the very high was uh, the third Saskatoon, which was the biggest payday um, back then in Canada, Golden Harvest. And um, I won that three years on the trot. 
and the third time I beat Phil in the final and uh, beat him five sets to two. So um, comprehensive. That, yeah, that was that was probably one of my best performances. Um, and the thing about it was was the Saturday I left on the sun on the Monday, and the Saturday I buried my father, oh, and I didn't want to go. I said I'm not going. And my mother said no, you've got to go. So. I don't know, two weeks later, I phoned her up and I said, she said, you won. I said, yeah. She said, I knew you would. So that kind of proved to me and it was a, a weird, a weird feeling because I was upset that I could forget about my father. And that upset me a little bit. I always remember it. But it also proved to me that once I was on the dartboard, I had a good focus. I had a good mindset and a good concentration. And although it was an upsetting period, it was also a period, because sometimes you don't have to prove to other people how good you are or what you're going to do. You have to prove it to yourself. And that was one of those things that I can identify, that I proved myself that I was one of the best in the world and that I could take on anything and focus and do it. Another time, my son Ryan, he was born in Las Vegas when I was in Las Vegas. He, I phoned home and thought, we've had the kid. She had it two weeks early, and funny enough, his birthday was yesterday, and I, he was 32, and I was, I've only been at home twice for his birthday, and that was in COVID. Every single year I've been away on his birthday. <laughs> well, obviously we've been very, very fortunate for probably about the last decade now that you've been coming down with the World Series to Australia and New Zealand, because obviously when you, you, the playing side um, finished, You've come into the administration of darts. Um, you were there at the time of the, uh, the split to go before it became into yeah. the PDC and, and all of that. That was a rough period for darts. And because of a, a certain TV program in the UK and the depiction of dart players, it sort of changed the whole mindset around the game in general. Yes, it did. But it wasn't only that. It was that the... The BDO, who the people who run the BDO, didn't have a business sense to take the game forward. Um, and in '91, Sky TV filmed the World Masters, and then BSB filmed the British Gold Cup, and then Sky bought out BSB, and they wanted to do some more tournaments, but the BDO didn't want to. So that was when the manufacturers got together because they'd lost every single event on TV apart from the World Championship on BBC. So, you know, when they turned down Sky, you know, the manufacturers and all the managers got together before the players and said, look, we've got to do something about getting this game back online. Um, but BDO wouldn't listen. I would say, okay, we'll do what I want. We don't want any more TV. And that's when the players signed up, the top players, um, to when we formed the WDC at the time. And it was hard work because you 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 know you're trying to do exhibitions, but the BDO people were telling us you can't the, the, you can't go and watch these these WDC players. And of course, the players that weren't good enough to hack it with us were now the top players. Mm. And you know we had to put up with a lot, um, but we uh, it was a, I think a lot easier for me because you know I had a roofing small roofing business, five six people worked for us. I had a bar. So I had an, an income anyway without darts. So it was quite easy for me, you know, when you get threatened to go, I ain't putting up with that. I don't care who you are, you're not gonna threaten me. Mm. And so, um, you know, I stood up to be counted and I will say that I stood up to be counted more than anybody um, because I ended up representing the players all through the court case, negotiating with Barry Hearn over shares that I got the players, the pension for 20 years. Um, that they got every Christmas. Um, so, you know, I had some good good discussions with Barry Hearn, got on well with him, still do. And then um, I won the match plays of 98 and 99, and then in early 2000, before I'm retaining it, I had my first knee operation. Um, and I should have, it was five days before the match play started. And I should have rehabilitated properly and pulled out, and you don't, you know, you carry on and then. Six months later, because of compensation, of putting everything on the right leg, then walking everything, I had a, the operation on the right, and then another year after that, I had the left one cleared up again. And I changed my throw. It, it, you know, you're trying to stand here and stand there, and it, my throw changed. And 
I was at the Reebok and I'd lost in the uh, UK Open in the last qualifier. And I got up the next morning and I walked out of the, the toilet and my wife was there and Ryan was there. It was a little blonde-haired fella there. And um, my knee was like that. And she said, you can't carry on. I said, no, no. And I'd looked in the mirror. And I said to the bloke in the mirror, am I good enough? And the bloke in the mirror says, no, you're not pack up. So I gave my son, Ryan, the darts and I said, here, yeah, son, hopefully you'll throw one day. I never will. I've never played a competitive game of darts since. Well, this is the thing, when, when you've made your mind up about something, it is dead set, it's final, it's yeah. set in stone. It doesn't change, it's like the immovable object. Yeah, it is, yeah. But the, the one thing about that, at the same time, Barry Hearn phoned me up and I went and see him and he says, right, you're crap at darts, come and work for me. <laughs> you see, that's what he said. And I said, oh, I don't know about that. And I felt that I'd been stabbed in the back by a few people. And he said, um, I'll give you this and this, this way, just this expensive. I said, I ain't a lot. Yes, he said, I, I don't know if you're any good. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, I want to take this game professional. I can do it financially. I need you to do it playing wise. And he gave me a free roll. Uh, so the first thing I did, I took us out of holiday camps, put us in sports halls, um, put the entry fee up um, for pro tours back then so that Joe Bloggs couldn't play. Because, I mean, I'm a very keen golfer. I can't go and tee it up with, you know, when Paul Gow was on the, the, the US tour, I can't go and tee it up with him. Mm. No other professional sport can an amateur actually just t turn up and tee it, tee it up or play. So that's the first thing we started to do was, was, you know, take the number of people that were serious to play, which made it more competitive. And then um, when that started to, to go and Barry started bringing the money and the prize money were going up and then we you know, got great dartboard cubicles instead of just individual ones. And we're playing really good sports halls. And in America at the time, um, which we were still banned, um, they come in and said, yeah, we'll, we'll do some. So they, they did them. And so we started having a proper circuit. And then from there, we, you know, I said, we need to, I, I did the module on golf. We need a tour card situation. We need a cube score situation. And then the people who don't make it, we need a challenge tour. And at the same time, uh, I said, we've got to bring youth. And um, so I started up youth tournaments. And this is all with the backing of the board of directors of, of the PDC mm -hmm. and the backing of Barry Hearn, 100%. Right, how much is it going to cost? Well, it's going to cost 100,000. Get and do it. Get and do it. Never, ever questioned. And, and that's why the system now, uh, and I will say that I hear a lot of people when they say, uh, you know, yeah, they had something to do with this. They had nothing to do with it. It was me coming up with the ideas, and I will say it myself, yeah. blow my own trumpet. Yeah, but I had to get it through the board, and getting it past Barry Home was so easy. He well, knew about sport. Well, look, if the cap fits, it has to be worn. Yeah. But there are a lot of a lot of. Um, I, 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 I don't like to use the word shysters, uh, but there are a number of them out there that, that are so happy to grab onto shirt tails and and, and claim credit for for things they haven't done. But we've. Since all of that took place, you've overseen and you've seen the growth of the code, not just in the UK, it's into Europe, it's now worldwide. Can we fit any more tournaments into, into that arena? No, we can't. What about a World Series? We've now got this, which is absolutely massive, and we see that with the crowds ar around, the, around the world, um, here, and, here and in New Zealand particularly great knowledgeable darting crowds and most of this if not all is pretty much down to you with the backing of, of Barry Hearn. Absolutely I mean it's not only us two I mean when Matt Porter come on as CEO. Um, I didn't want know, to mention him. Sorry? I didn't want to mention him. Yeah <laughs> well no he you know he's a great administrator I mean if you want a, a mm. dart tournament on the moon Matt can do it oh, and yeah. now he's got a big staff um, but, you know it it's a package, you know, one person can't do it, two people, but the package works. And that's what yep. Barry did. He made sure that the people that were behind him were the right people. I mean, it was very easy for me to come up with an idea, go to a board meeting and go, we've got to do this. I want a youth tournament. I want this, I want that. Okay, all right, Matt, get and do it. So I had nothing to do with the administration, you know. So it, it is, you need the, the package, you need a good company and the company is right. I mean, you know, I still have players come up to me and, well, this is not right, that's not right. You can never please everybody. The ranking can't be 100% right, 
Tournaments can't be 100% right. But overall, the package is very good. And if you play well, and I say this to players, I don't have to know more, thank God. Um, if you play well, you will earn money. You will not complain. It's only the people that perhaps are not good enough at the moment, maybe good enough years down the road, that are not earning enough money, then they moan. Um, and I've had to put up with some moaners, some pro professional <laughs> moaners in my time. And I won't miss that. I won't miss that. I'm, uh, me and a guy called Dave Allen, who, who works for the BBC, as everyone knows, um, a workaholic, mm -hmm. every single weekend we were at tournaments, just trying to make sure they run right, you know, do this, do that. You know, the Premier Leagues and the World Series, you know, I didn't really have anything to do with bringing that in, or I was around the board, and we were talking about it. I said, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. Um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, now I can walk away because I'm not needed anymore. The systems that, that are in place um, are great. There's not a lot more I can do. I would like to see the Pro Tours um, go into more European events, you know, upstage it to do that. but. That's not in my time. It's time for me to to step aside, retire, um, and do what I want to do. And I've made up my mind. I did two years ago, and I went to Barry and Barry said, "You're a lazy bugger now, anyway." Um, <laughs> yeah, he kind of to the point, Barry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what pe people like about Barry yeah. Hearn. Is it's it's not he's got no airs and graces, but. He tells it as it is, he, and I think that's what everyone appreciates. Absolutely. He's been 100% with me. Yeah, I, I had another couple of years left as, as the director, and a guarantee from him. Um, and and I, he went, right, let's get it done now. You know. So that's why on the, the 1st of August was my last day with the board. And, and I'm, I'm quite easy. People go, oh, you know, you, no, I'm more than happy. I'm, you know, I've got grandchildren at home. Um, uh, my daughter's just back from twins as well. So we've set ourselves up. We had another business, a property business. That's been sold. All the houses have been sold soon. You know, I've not been silly in life with my money. I didn't rely on total darts. So I, I, I'd set that up and, and now that's financially supported us and with all the other things. And, so, yeah, I can. My wife is the accountant of the company. I'm the hammer and bobster man. My wife's the intelligent <laughs> one. That's absolutely true. Usual. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And we went through the books and we said, yeah, we can retire. We can, you know, have a nice time. We can do this and we can do that. What, so, what is on the cards for this retirement? Um, I will spend uh, quite a bit of the winter in Spain. I have... Um, my wife and I have bought a big lodge on a big lake complex up in Lincolnshire. We'll be moving in there in September. Um, I'm mad keen fisherman. It's on a massive lake with plenty of fishing, so we've got it there. It's in the middle of nowhere. I'm a country boy at heart, live in the country. So I will love that. In, in lockdown, we were going out for walks and bike rides. And she comes fishing with me and sits there reading. So yeah, and of course I've got the grandchildren and now Harry, my 10 year old, um, he, he likes his football, he likes his cricket, he loves coming fishing with me. Um, Millie, she's into karate now at seven years old. Oh. And yeah, so it, it's, there's plenty for me too. My son, younger son Ryan, he's got a kid now. And like I said, my daughter's expecting twins. I've got another elder son who hasn't got any children at the moment, but they're very career minded, him and his wife. And, uh, good whack, I have to say. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely easy for me to go. But, you know, I'm coming up 65. I don't want to keep travelling and putting my body through things, although I'm a very fit man for my age. I don't want to keep putting my body through things that is going to hurt me down the road. Mm -hmm. You know, lying in the sun in Spain in the winter helps out the old arthritis in the knees. And sitting beside a lake fishing is... Um, and we'll be still going on the bike rides and the walks, but, you know, at our leisure. With all of these things, are you A, you going to be able to fit in a round of golf, do you think? And B, do you reckon you'll catch a shark? I will not go anywhere near them sharks. <laughs> I cannot believe I, I'll go for a walk on the beach and I'll see people surfing. I mean, I know us English go over the top when we talk about sharks. And the wife came out here, as you know, for a six-week holiday with me. And 
We, we see sharks, we see crocodiles. We see so many crocodiles up in Cairns. And I think sometimes you Aussies are a little bit mad going out there. <laughs> I know they say the chances of a shark or a crocodile getting you. But I've been fairly all right in life and I ain't gonna take no more <laughs> chances. I really am not. Uh, I love my swimming, do a lot of swimming. You're not gonna catch me swimming in the sea out here. Mate, it is, this last decade has been an absolute pleasure having you here. I think you are really going to be an enormous loss um, to darts because you've said to me privately, you're walking away, you're done, you're finished. There'll be nothing to do with darts, full stop. I can only wish you and your good lady and the rest of your family a very, very happy retirement and thank you once again for your time. No, it's my pleasure. I mean, uh, over the last, what, 10, 12 years, I've met a lot of people here and, um, you know, a lot of my friends and no doubt quite a few of them will still Facebook and Twitter and, you know, reply to them, like people all over the world from India and Pakistan, um, which, is, which is great. And uh, I've met a lot of friends, had a great time, wonderful career in darts, playing and, and what I do now. Um, too old to carry on. Never too old. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. very much.